G'day folks and welcome. I'm Chris Faber. And I'm TJ Steadman. And you're listening to the Answers to Giant Questions podcast coming to you from sunny Western Australia. G'day folks and welcome back to the Answers to Giant Questions podcast, the show that tackles your questions about the biblical giants. This episode is going to be huge. We're continuing our deep dive into the character of Enoch, uh, the guy who, according to the text of First Enoch, was explicitly called the Son of Man. So what's, what's going on there, Tim? No, we're going there already, are we? No pleasantries? No, how you going? You're just going to drop me straight in it. All right, fine. Well, just so you know, I can't just answer a question without giving you some background first, right? Because it's me and that's what I do. And my wife is furiously nodding her head right now, even though she's in the other room, because she knows you just don't get a straight answer out of me without a significant amount of context beforehand. And that's what makes me good at this, I reckon. I'm also really humble, probably the most humble person in Australia. And I would say even the world, definitely the most humble person in the world. Okay, Donald. Well, I'm getting a bit of a big head here because I just realised we've been doing this for over two years now. Two years? Has it really been that long? Yeah, I can't believe it. And I seriously can't believe that I missed that. Like, that anniversary came and went last month. And, yeah, it was completely off my radar. Two years of the Answers to Giant Questions podcast. That's insane. It is. It's also kind of impressive. And uh, I didn't get you an anniversary present. Oh, that's all right. Neither did I. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty cool, but... I'm also trying not to think about the fact that we're less than halfway through what we set out to do so far. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. So what we're going to do this week is look at what's possibly the most troubling aspect of the book of First Enoch for a lot of people, which is the part where the angel says to Enoch that Enoch is the son of man. And we know that son of man is a term that Jesus used of himself, and it's connected very strongly with the concept of Messiah. For a lot of people, seeing that specific phrase in First Enoch is enough for them to decry First Enoch as a heresy and justify a strong opposition to the use of the book of First Enoch in any capacity. And so we're going to have a look at that today and just analyse that situation in First Enoch and see whether or not we can understand that use of terminology there in its context to try and better understand why anybody would use that kind of terminology about Enoch. Because a lot of us will have had the experience of finally making some time to sit down and read First Enoch in an attempt to get a better cultural and contextual frame of reference for the New Testament. And you sit there and read through First Enoch, and at times it's really engaging and really fascinating and really informative. And just when you start to think that all that negative talk about the book of First Enoch is so overblown and unnecessarily antagonistic, then you come across this thing where Enoch gets called the son of man. And you know that's a messianic title, and it's jarring, it's offensive, because we're Christians and we know that that's a title that belongs to Jesus. So we see it there applied to Enoch, and we know that those two are not the same guy. We can't have people referring to Enoch as though he is, in very nature, God. And for a lot of us, the natural response to this would be to say, well, we were told that first Enoch was never included in the Bible for good reasons. And this must be one of those reasons. So I'll take this book with a pinch of salt and just move past this because it's obviously one of those examples where First Enoch is clearly wrong. And it's a reminder to just take the meat and spit out the bones when reading Second Temple period literature. But I'm going to suggest that there's a way to read that passage of First Enoch that does not result in heresy against sound Christian doctrine. In other words, it's not going to land us in a position where we have to equate Enoch with God. And as a matter of fact, it's absolutely necessary to view this correctly to understand what certain New Testament authors are doing when they write their letters later on. But before we do that, I want to talk about cover bands. One of the things that I like about going to the pub is live music, and more often than not, that means some local band will be playing covers of music that I like to hear. And when I go to my local, I'm going to hear Smokey Joe's old-timey pub cover band, or whatever they call themselves, and when they start playing Smoke on the Water... My response is going to be, oh, yeah, I love this song. It's not going to be, hey, wait a minute, is that actually Deep Purple playing here live on that dank rickety stage in the corner? Yes, it obviously just because a cover band plays a popular song doesn't mean that they somehow become the original artist, although I guess they kind of perform that function in a way. Yeah, that's right. As long as the cover band is playing ACDC's original music, then they act in the capacity of that band. So ACDC are not present, but I'm hearing them. In that sense... Smokey Joe's old-timey pub cover band become or act in the power of Bon Scott. So I could be sitting at the sail and anchor in Fremantle in the shadow of the old Fremantle prison and listening to Jailbreak and completely forget that it's not Bon Scott playing, it's Smokey Joe's old-timey pub cover band. But in that moment, it's ACDC for me. So let's cast our minds back to the prophet Elijah in the Old Testament. 
it's kind of interesting that we're going to be talking briefly about Elijah, given that all this is in the context of trying to understand Enoch. And the two of them just happen to be the only people in biblical history who were taken up to heaven to be with God without dying first. Anyway, the thing about Elijah is that he had a particular ministry as a prophet of Yahweh, which got him in a lot of hot water for speaking the truth to powerful people who didn't want none of that. Elijah brought a message of repentance. But because of the false religion of the nation's leaders, he was forced to ostracize himself and to live in the wilderness. Incidentally, the greatest threat against Elijah's life came not from the evil king Ahab, but from his wife Jezebel. She turned out to be a lot more dangerous than her husband. Not many people get their appearance recorded in the Bible, but particular note was made of the clothes that Elijah wore. He had a garment made of hair and a leather belt. Elijah ate weird stuff. God had birds bring him food to eat. Incidentally, that was the inspiration behind the name of the Raven Creek Social Club. By the way, have you ever seen a bird feeding its young? Do you think the ravens fed Elijah like that? I don't want to think about that. And I'll thank you for not mentioning it again in my hearing. What about if I just made the noises? Okay, that's enough. You can stop that now. Thank you very much. Sorry. Elijah had a pretty hard time and was isolated for long periods where he had to deal with serious doubts about his calling. Some people have interpreted this as depression, but I'm not sure we can necessarily substantiate that. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Scripture tells us that on one such occasion, and you can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 19, he went and hid himself under a tree, and depending on your translation, you might have different names for this, but it's commonly known as the juniper or the broom tree. And this particular tree is known for having a multitude of long branches arising from a very short trunk, And those long, thin branches are often cut to make broom handles because they look like long, thin bars. Elijah literally spent time behind bars during this period of fear and doubt. It's like he was in a self-imposed birdcage. Yeah, that's enough bird stuff. It's it's weird. (laughs) Sorry, again. Some influential people talked about Elijah. We'll start with the prophet Malachi. Ah, the Italiano profeta, Malachi. Oh, you know when the pastor's visiting your church and giving a message from Malachi, 10 out of 10 times you're going to hear that joke. It's only funny once. Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. If we go to chapter 4, verse 1. He says, for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now, I think you know where we're headed with this because anyone who's familiar with the Gospels will recognize the use of these scripture references with regard to John the Baptist. Yep, tracking with you so far. So Luke chapter 1 verse 11, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So the angel Gabriel made reference to Malachi when he spoke to John's father. And the author of the Gospel of Mark also had a bit to say about John with regard to Elijah touching on a prophecy by the prophet Isaiah in the process. This is Mark chapter 1 from verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. 
John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now I'm starting to see a lot of parallels between Elijah and John the Baptist. Yeah, that's right. And there are a lot more coming. But we've got a problem here because John himself said that he was not Elijah. This is from John chapter 1, reading from verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So we've got the author of one gospel using Isaiah's prophecy to say that John the Baptist is the guy. And then another gospel writer uses the same scripture, but John himself says he's not the guy. And even after all this stuff has been said about how John was going to herald the coming of the Messiah, and John even met the Messiah, I mean, he actually baptized Jesus, still John had his doubts. And we're back to this picture of Elijah, the guy who's concealed behind bars. Remember the broom tree? Having doubts about his ability to function according to his calling. This is from Matthew 11, verse 1. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For well, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. That's a terrible translation. and uh, You should read it as come against it with violence. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, or in a certain manner of interpretation, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't mourn. But John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. And that's a nice little reference at the end of that passage. Back to the words of the archangel Gabriel when he spoke to Elizabeth. Incidentally, in Luke's retelling of this event, he includes the following. This is Luke seven twenty nine to 30. When all the people heard this and the tax collectors too, they declared God just having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. So that's a nice little reference to the fruit of repentance, justifying or serving as a witness to wisdom. And of course, wisdom is a reference to God in the second person of the Godhead, who we know as the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And you'll be familiar with that from Proverbs chapter 8, where wisdom is described as having a role in creation. That's so cool. Where do you find all this stuff? Lots of reading and listening to people who are smarter than me. Not going to lie. Anyway, the parable that we were just reading about the children in the marketplace is effectively Jesus having a dig at the religious leaders of his day who are basically just being disruptive and annoying like 
kids hanging out at the shopping centre, antagonising people instead of doing something useful. They ostracised John for preaching doom and gloom. They had a crack at Jesus for associating with the wrong people. But their real thrust was that they wanted Jesus and John to play by their rules and get with the program of religious hypocrisy and corruption that was making them popular and wealthy. You're supposed to sing the song and dance to their tune, but those guys weren't even legitimate authorities. So why would you do that? John, just like Elijah and and Jesus, for that matter, was unable to coexist with the corruption and the depravity and the false worship that existed in Jerusalem. This is why he was out in the wilderness. Anyway, let's continue. This time we're going to read about the transfiguration of Jesus from Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they'd seen until the son of man had risen from the dead. So they kept this matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the son of man? that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. This last part is made much easier to understand in Matthew 17. The disciples asked him, Then why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So what's going on here? You talked about cover bands before. Are you saying John the Baptist was basically just playing covers of the prophet Elijah? Well, I wouldn't put it in those terms, but yeah. John dressed like Elijah, ate like Elijah, ministered as a prophet like Elijah, preached repentance like Elijah, spent time in the wilderness like Elijah, got persecuted like Elijah, had his doubts about his ministry like Elijah, Spent time behind bars like Elijah. Didn't see that one coming, did you? And ultimately got in trouble with a powerful woman like Elijah. That's awesome. But uh, what's that bit about restoring all things and turning the hearts of the children to their fathers? It's about his message of repentance, bringing people back to living as God's imagers. And in Jewish culture, the fathers were the patriarchs and the children were the present generation, not just the kids. We're not talking about a nuclear family relationship here. Hey, you want to know something cool? You've got three guys at the Transfiguration, right? Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Now, Moses had died, but nobody saw his body. He comes back on the mountain. Elijah ascended to heaven in a chariot of fire and never died. But John the Baptist was already dead at this point, so Elijah comes back on the mountain. But another famous righteous man in Scripture disappeared without a trace. What about Enoch? Who was standing there in the spirit of Enoch? Jesus. What? I thought we were saying Enoch was definitely not Jesus. Yeah, you're right. We're not. But you see, John wasn't Elijah either. He said so himself, right? And yet Jesus saw who John was functioning as. So what? Are you saying that Jesus was functioning as Enoch? I'm not saying that. You're not going to start talking about oranges again, are you? This is all very confusing. I'm not saying that because I don't have to. Peter said that. Oh, I don't know. I'm just really confused. Well, you know how the author of Hebrews talks about Jesus as our great high priest in the order of Melchizedek, because he sees Melchizedek in Christ. That's on the back of messianic expectations that we see reflected in the literature of the Qumran community and centuries of Jewish tradition. Incidentally, he talks about Melchizedek as though he never died either. Anyway, that's an example of typology. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the author of Hebrews can see it. The Apostle Paul sees Jesus as a new Adam. We talked about that before. Again, this is a kind of typology. And the same thing happens with Peter, but he sees Jesus as Enoch. Remember how last week we talked about the Book of the Watchers and how Enoch brought a message to the imprisoned watchers, telling them that God would not show them mercy and that they would not have peace. Yeah, I remember that. 
So Peter casts Jesus in that light when he writes this from 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers, having been subjected to him. And this is after Peter had already talked about being present at the Transfiguration event, which I mentioned a minute ago. Obviously, the death of Jesus and his experience of bodily resurrection are unique to Jesus. But this part about him preaching to the spirits in prison. That's a direct reference to Enoch. And he's basically saying that Jesus spoke to those same rebellious sons of God who were imprisoned back in the days of Noah. Peter sees that as a reiteration of the judgment issued by Enoch when he spoke on behalf of God to the watchers. So just to be clear, Peter isn't saying that Jesus is a new Enoch or that Enoch is Jesus or anything like that. What he is saying is that the prophet Enoch provided a type and Jesus, the prophet, fulfilled that type. So Jesus, by doing what Enoch has done before, effectively functions as Enoch. Okay, I think I understand what you mean there, but I kind of feel like we're missing the point of what we said we were going to talk about in this episode because what we all really want to know is why Enoch gets called the Son of Man in the book of First Enoch, chapter 71, in language that very clearly equates him with the Messiah. That's the bit that gets everyone upset. So what's going on there? So we have some translation issues that we need to talk about first. Because there's going to be a lot of people reading First Enoch in the Charles translation and thinking, well, I don't see that in the text, so why are we even talking about this? So let's have a look at the Charles translation. This is First Enoch chapter 71 from verse 12, and this is written in the first person from the perspective of Enoch himself. And these blessings which went forth out of my mouth were well-pleasing before that head of days. And that head of days came with Michael and Gabriel, Raphael and Phanuel, thousands and ten thousands of angels without number. Then there's a little parenthesis here and it says lost passage wherein the son of man was described as accompanying the head of days and Enoch asked one of the angels concerning the son of man as to who he was. And then it picks up in verse 14 and he that is the angel came to me and greeted me with his voice and said unto me this is the son of man who was born unto righteousness and righteousness abides over him and the righteousness of the head of days forsakes him not. And he said unto me. He proclaims unto thee peace in the name of the world to come. For from hence has proceeded peace since the creation of the world. And so shall it be unto thee forever and forever and ever. And all shall walk in his ways since righteousness never forsaketh him. With him will be their dwelling places and with him their heritage. And they shall not be separated from him forever and ever and ever. And so there shall be length of days with that son of man and the righteous shall have peace and an upright way in the name of the Lord of spirits forever and ever. All right, so that's the end of the passage. Now, we have a bit of a problem here. You might have noticed in that reading that Charles has inserted a note that says that a part of the text had been lost. The problem with that is that we have lots of other manuscripts of First Enoch and they do not feature any gap in that place that would suggest missing text. Not only that, but all the places where the Son of Man is referred to as he or him or his in all those pronouns there, they're actually in the original text, second person pronouns like you and your. Let's read it again, this time from the Shod translation. So this is the same passage. And these blessings which proceeded from my mouth were well pleasing before that head of days. And that head of days came with Michael and Gabriel, Raphael and Phanuel, and with thousands and with 10,000 times thousand angels without number. And that angel came to me and greeted me with his voice and said to me, Thou art a son of man who was born to justice, and justice dwells over thee, and the justice of the head of days will not depart from thee. And he said to me, He calls peace unto thee in the name of the world which is to come, for thence peace proceeds since the creation of the world, and thus it will be to thee, to eternity, and from eternity to eternity. And all who will continue to walk in thy path, thou whom justice does not leave in eternity, their dwelling places will be with thee, 
and they will not be separated from thee in eternity and from eternity to eternity. And so long life will be with that son of man and peace will be to the just and his right path to the just in the name of the Lord of spirits to all eternity. So this translation is a bit closer to the original text, but still the translator has opted for thou art a son of man here. And we won't read the whole thing again, but here's the central part of that text once more, and this time from the Hermonia translation. And the head of days came with Michael and Raphael and Gabriel and Phanuel and thousands and tens of thousands of angels without number. And he came to me and greeted me with his voice and said to me, You are that son of man who was born for righteousness and righteousness dwells on you and the righteousness of the head of days will not forsake you. So what's going on with these different translations? Honestly, I think I was a bit more comfortable with the first one you read because they didn't talk about Enoch the way that we talk about Jesus. Yeah, that's the real issue here. The problem is that we hear something and then we go, oh, I don't like that because it makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes me feel like this is upsetting my theology here, so it must be wrong. And basically, Charles has come along and made the assumption that there must be some missing text which would clarify the distinction And then he's gone and deliberately changed all the pronouns so that the plain reading of the text suited his Christian theology. Because from his perspective, you can't have Enoch being talked about explicitly in messianic terms in light of our understanding of who Jesus is. And we had a similar issue with the second translation that I read, the Shod translation, which despite sticking closer to the original text, still avoided a definite identification between Enoch and the Son of Man. The translator has deliberately avoided using the definite article. He says, a son of man. So he's walking a fine line there and allowing readers to decide whether or not they want to see Enoch as a messianic figure. And that's a wise choice to make for the sake of keeping people happy and remaining largely faithful to the text. And then we come to that last one that I read from the Hermonia translation, which doesn't make any attempt to accommodate certain theological views here and just translates the text. All right, but how are we supposed to understand that? Okay, well, let's just talk about something really basic to get started. Firstly, we know that it's Jesus himself who applies that title, Son of Man, to himself. We saw that earlier in Matthew and in Mark. Now, I've heard all kinds of people say things like, oh, you know, that's just Jesus taking some special kind of delight in his humanity. must have been such a great novelty to be like one of his creations. And maybe that's true, but that's a long way from capturing the significance of this particular phrase, because it turns up elsewhere in the Bible. Early in scripture, we see the phrase son of man used to describe an ordinary human being, just a generic phrase that describes any ordinary person. But then we start to see it used in the prophets and especially in the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel himself is referred to as son of man. It's quite clear that if someone is called the son of man, they're expected to be human. Not only that, they're expected to be a prophet. Okay, well, I can see how that works. Well, what happens over time is we begin to see the development of the idea that the second person of the Trinity, who is frequently spoken of as having attributes like those of a human, will actually be revealed as a son of man. And as the expectation of a coming Messiah begins to formulate in the Jewish psyche, it becomes oriented around this figure of the son of man. And that's a very late development because we don't get the specific reference that Jesus is talking about until we get to the book of Daniel, specifically Daniel 7. Again, I'm an early date guy for Daniel, but we're still at the earliest in the late part of the exile. Actually, the fact that First Enoch makes use of Daniel argues for an early date for Daniel because First Enoch was written between the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC and relies on Daniel. Here's the text. This is from verse 13 of chapter 7. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. There's lots of cool stuff in that passage. But one thing I noticed just now is that the son of man comes to the ancient of days like he's not already there. Yeah, that's a great observation, Chris. One of the most notable things of this passage is probably hard to pick up initially. But the idea that the son of man comes to the ancient of days is significant because he's not going away from the ancient days and he's not already there. He's coming from somewhere else. Logically, that would be the domain of men. That would be the earth. Also, the concept of dominion over the nations that comes up in the Daniel 7 passage is a big part of the messianic expectation. And we'd also see that second power in heaven kind of language there. 
as the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days. And that connects back to the divine council imagery and the idea that these lesser gods have this territorial authority and dominion. And we know that from the beginning, it wasn't supposed to be this way. So the expectation is that the Messiah is going to fix this. So he's going to have to be someone who can deal with those rebellious sons of God, the Watchers. So Daniel, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, might have been able to see Jesus in this vision, but for Daniel's audience and those who came after him, this person was still a mystery. They don't know who he is. Yeah, and then along comes Enoch in the Book of the Watchers, written about this time or later, and we're talking early 2nd century BC, the absolute latest. And he can do this thing where he becomes a conduit of God's word to the Watchers. He can pass judgment on behalf of the Lord. And he does this as a human. He's real. And he's embodied and he can do these things because he can walk among Elohim, according to Genesis 5. Now, Enoch doesn't get spoken of in specifically godlike terms. He doesn't get called the cloud rider or anything like that, even though we're told that he gets taken to be where God is. And rightly so. But when Jesus calls himself the son of man in Matthew 24 and in his defense before Caiaphas in Matthew 26, he uses this language of coming on the clouds of heaven. This is a direct reference twice to Daniel 7. So Jesus talked about his resurrection there because he tells Caiaphas, you will see the coming of the Son of Man. Yeah, that's right, Chris. This isn't about the second coming. It's about the resurrection. Peter picks up on the Son of Man language there and compares Jesus to Enoch in light of the resurrection. And we have type and fulfillment of type, two human characters, both prophets, who go to visit the realm of the evil dead, deliver a message of victory and the final judgment of the wicked, and ascend to be with the Ancient of Days, the Lord of Spirits, the Most High God. So what's happening with Enoch in 1 Enoch 71 is that he's being a prefigurement of the Messiah. He is who the Son of Man will be like. That whole passage is in reference to events that, from the perspective of the author, are in the future. Because he does what the Son of Man is going to do. And this is clearly the understanding that Peter had when he wrote his epistle. So on the basis of first century Jewish application of the text of 1 Enoch, I think we can confidently say that the Son of Man, as a reference to Enoch, does not contradict the use of that terminology by Jesus, even in a messianic context. So on a functional level, Enoch was being the Messiah, even though he wasn't ultimately going to be him. Yeah, yeah. What we see when we look at Enoch is somebody who was doing what Christ would later do and thus carrying out the works of the Messiah. That doesn't make him God. It doesn't make him Jesus any more than John the Baptist was really Elijah. But from a functional perspective, he acts as that guy. He gets to be, from a certain perspective, a messianic figure. We've been talking about this since the start of this podcast. Doing is being. And that's the whole thrust of the identification of Enoch in the parables of Enoch. He provides a picture of who the Messiah will be. And in doing that, he sets up the people of God for the expectation of the Messiah, who was yet to come and who would ultimately find fulfillment in Jesus Christ. I should point out, too, that these prototypes and types and fulfillments of type are largely unintentional by the people involved. And I say that because I'm quite sure that John the Baptist didn't get himself thrown in jail so that he could be behind bars, just like Elijah hid in the broom tree. I don't think that Enoch went on this visionary journey into Sheol just so that he could provide a model for the future works of Christ. And I say that because you've got people arguing for this kind of thing as the basis for the concept of patron saints. Really? I never thought of that. Yeah, I'm not opposed to the idea of patron saints, but I don't think we can take it from this type and fulfillment imagery. John's not sitting there going, oh, I hope Herod's brother's wife comes along and demands that I be executed so that I can be just like Elijah, who was hunted down by Jezebel. That's not happening. You might get me to agree as far as the message of repentance, the crazy dress sense, being out in the wilderness because of persecution, but you really can't push much further. Patron saints, as the name implies, actually comes from the Roman cultural concept of patronage, in which somebody who has done something good for you is considered worthy of your loyalty and imitation in as far as you would devote your life to live in the way that they lived in honour of them and what they'd done for you. That's Roman culture. It's probably not what John the Baptist had in mind. And obviously Jesus isn't thinking to himself, well, I want Enoch to be my patron saint, so I'm going to do what he did. That'd be ridiculous. Yeah, you can't go there. We've got to remember that the Bible is literature and it's written by people familiar with literature. And they're using that literature to communicate the word of God to their audience and by extension to you. That's what connects all these characters together. That's why Jesus can be Adam and Enoch and Melchizedek. That's why John the Baptist can be Elijah. But at the same time, we're forced by the text to acknowledge the sovereignty of God in the working out of all these things. Because again, just like Elijah in the broom tree, there's no way you can argue 
that that detail was inserted after John the Baptist was imprisoned just for the sake of a literary connection. God is working with and through these things. And whether you consider First Enoch to be counted as inspired scripture or not, and I still maintain that it isn't, by the way, you can't deny that this text was used to guide people toward a knowledge of the Messiah in Jesus Christ. I've always said that as useful as First Enoch can be as literature, it doesn't tell us anything that the Bible itself doesn't reveal to us. That's true. And uh, speaking of the revealing of secrets, it's about time that we wrapped this up and moved on to the answering of questions that are giant. Yeah, that's a good call, mate. Next week, we're going to continue talking about how people in the New Testament make use of the book of Enoch. So anyway, just to be clear, Enoch is not the Messiah. He's just a very good boy. Let's move on. I want to hear your giant questions. If you have a question about stuff you've heard on the show or somewhere else, something you found in your Bible or just some general feedback you'd like to tell us and the world at large, here's how you do it. Head to the website, giantanswers.com. Send me an email at giantanswers at outlook.com. I personally receive all your mail and I will try to get to all of it. I love hearing from you, especially if I can help you with answers to your giant questions. Okay, time for some uh, giant questions Q&A. So Warren is uh, back again this week with another question. Thanks, Warren. And don't forget, listeners, you too can be like Warren and send in questions, as many as you want. Just go to giantanswers.com. Anyway, here's Warren's question. Where David says to Goliath, the living God, you are sure to note that in your book. I've never thought this before, but now that I have a different worldview, why did David emphasize a living God when all Elohim are gods and they're all alive, but Yahweh, of course, is the most powerful or one true God. So my question is, why did they say living God? Is it because the idols were dead? I assume that they knew that the spirits behind them were alive. Hope this makes sense. That's a good question, Warren. So it comes from the story of David and Goliath, which is 1 Samuel chapter 17, and in particular, verse 36. David says, Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Okay, so this is an interesting one because the construction in Hebrew is Chaim Elohim. You also get this in verse 26 of this chapter. Obviously, we recognize the word Elohim as a reference to God. And that other word, Chaim, is the one that is making this difficult. It derives from the root Hayah, to live. But it's got a plural form, which means that we're supposed to understand this as those who live or the living, which means that this phrase isn't supposed to be read as the living God, but the God of the living. And as I've said before about the term Elohim, when you find it used with reference to the scriptural God, it is a superlative. He's not just God or a God. He is the God of gods, the one who is supreme over all spiritual beings. So when you see Chaim Elohim, you know that he is not just the God of some living things. He is the God of all living things. He's the God of life. He is the God who makes all things live. That's how we're supposed to read this. So when David confronts Goliath in battle, knowing full well that the gods of Goliath were gods associated with death cults, he knows that when he stands in the name of the God of the living, he's not going to lose. The gods of the death cults are glorified by death, and it doesn't matter whose death it is. Our God is glorified in life, and in particular, the life of those who are faithful to him. So that's a fairly quick and simple answer to that question from Warren concerning the use of the phrase, the living God, in 1 Samuel 17. It'd be nice to just leave it there, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't point out that there are other instances where the Hebrew wording behind the English translation is actually different. When we look at Joshua 3, verse 10, we also have in English, the living God. But in this case, the Hebrew is el Hayel, literally, God, living God. And this time, the subject of the verb is only God. So it's not the God of the living, it's the God who is living. More than that, we see here a polemic against the God of the Canaanites, who is also called El. Joshua is referring to the fact that in Canaanite mythology, the Most High God was inactive and simply sat back and let Baal run things. In this case, Joshua is talking about how God is going to drive out the giants, the Anakim, in their various tribes and clans from the Promised Land. So why do we have the living God used here? I'm going to suggest that in this case, we should think of living in terms of moving. You see this in Hebrew idiom all the time. Water that moves is called living water. Stones that move are called living stones. And a God who moves with his people and drives out their enemies before them is a living God. In this case, specifically, the living God. And there are other variations on this kind of language that you'll see as you go through scripture. In each case, you're going to find particular language which will be relevant to the context. 
We could keep going, but it's about time we wrapped up this episode. So thanks again for the question, Warren. And to all our listeners out there, please keep your questions coming. Indeed. Well, that was short and sweet, which is just the way I like it. Let's do it all again next week. We certainly will. And when we come back next week, we'll be talking about the influence of the stories of Enoch on the New Testament. See you then. Thanks for listening. It's time to wrap up today's episode. But if you want more, don't forget to get yourself a copy of Answers to Giant Questions. We're asking readers to please leave a review of the book on Amazon or Goodreads to help it become more visible in search results. Even if you just give it stars, that'll help. But a full review is certainly really appreciated. Please also leave a review of this podcast wherever you found us so that new listeners can find us here on the show. This podcast comes out every week, but you want to make sure you never miss an episode. So if you haven't already subscribed, do that now and you'll get notified when each new episode drops. That's all we have time for today. We'll catch you next time on the Answers to Giant Questions podcast. Thank you for listening to the Answers to Giant Questions podcast, a production of the Raven Creek Social Club. If you like what you heard today, please take a moment to rate or review the show. Music supplied under copyright by Grave Forsaken, graveforsaken.com. You can get the book Answers to Giant Questions by TJ Stedman on Amazon in paperback and Kindle format. Check out the other podcasts at ravencreeksc.com and go to giantanswers.com for more Answers to Giant Questions. Read the blog, catch us on the socials. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends about the show. Send us your giant questions and stay tuned to this podcast to get answers. We'll see you next time. Until then, stay safe and God bless. Is this the, uh, the the new abode? It is the new abode. Um, it's yeah, but it's uh, it's a nice place. Um, and the bedroom is like back that way. Oh, yeah. the toilet that way, and then the spare bedroom is behind okay. the TV, which is wow. pretty small. But that's where we're getting the virtual, virtual tour. And here we are. Here we are. Chris Bather, urbanite, city dweller, man of means and leisure. Uh, uh, yes, I am all of those things. I guess. Um, Oh, it's good, yeah. It's uh, it's good to be in the city. It's it's been a dream of mine for a long time. So um, mm. yeah, I'm just excited to kind of have people over and stuff as well. You know, oh, it's good, mate. It is. How are you? Um, well, I am recovering from a cold that I've had all week. Um, mm. but I think I'm uh, over the over the hill now. I'm also recovering from the cold. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's been good actually because I've had a few days off and that's given me lots of time to write. I actually got next week's episode already done. Oh, oh nice. Which is great because the one after that's going to take me ages. It's going to really mess with my head. So right, okay. <laughs> extra time. Right. <laughs> you just made a cake. You can't work after you've made a cake. Yes, and uh, obviously just because they cover bland, cover bland. So what's going on here? You, you, yeah. Sorry, I lost my place. Uh, oh, yes. All right, I will ready myself, mm. gird my loins and other parts of me that require girding. Yes, gird all of the things. No, well, I mean, if you haven't heard of Malachi, where have you been? Okay, that's enough. You can stop that now. Thank you very much.